Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to Night Light Part 2, everyone. Hope all the dads had a great Father's Day. Uh, let me give you a little background on our guest. I saw him on the Three Beards podcast a few months ago, and I was really impressed. And you know, when they announced uh, he was returning, I was like, you know, hey, uh, hey Craig, you know, let me uh, join the uh, chat before the Sure, I'd just like to meet Charlie. So, you know, uh, you know, join the StreamYard chat and introduce myself to Charlie and uh, said stuff like, oh, and, you know, I re really liked your first appearance. Looking forward to seeing what you have to uh, cover tonight. Um, you know, I'd like to ha have you on Nightlight at some point, and you know, Charlie is saying, oh, okay, uh, give, give me a call tomorrow, and, you know, we'll figure out to, to something, you know, looking forward to, uh, you know, doing, like, some kind of more history-themed show, and so, you know, while well, Charlie and I are, you know, kind of having, like, that kind of, uh, chat, you know, green room chat going on, all of a sudden, Craig starts with this, three, two, one, we are live, and I was like, uh, what this guy write? I haven't read anything yet. Um, you know, I'm just sitting there in like a pajama t-shirt. You know, I wasn't ready to be on the show. I, I, I'm not supposed to be here. So uh, that was our initial meeting. Uh, thanks, Craig. And a couple weeks later, I recommended Charlie for a show. And uh, we were sternly reprimanded. Uh, during and after the show, uh, nearly fired for the third time in four years. So what's going to happen tonight? Uh, will this be the first episode that Nightlight has an on-air abduction by the men in black? But if you attack Mark Eddy, you are attacking podcasting. So who is this mostly peaceful Charlie? Come on, man. Don't, don't you know who Charlie Robinson is? Aside from getting me into trouble, let's circle back to his biography. Charlie is the host of the Macroaggressions podcast. He co-authored the Controlled Demolition of the American Empire with Jeff Barrick. He will be uh, – he, he has released his uh, book, The Octopus – of global control and his website is the octopus of global control dot com hey charlie how you doing i'm great it's uh it's good to be with you and hopefully we won't get reprimanded after this one you know launch seems we'll like see. uh yeah we, yeah we'll see uh <laughs> <laughs> we just <laughs> We were a uh, little know, too deep the last time around, that's all. Yeah, you know, I don't think yeah. they were prepared for where we were going, and we went a little off the rails, and, 
and I thought it was I thought it was fine, but uh, you know, I mean, everybody's got their opinions on it, so we'll yeah. we'll keep it we'll keep things ab- above water on on this one. Yeah. And there's so much to uh, talk about; it's really almost impossible to figure yeah. out where to start. So we'll just we'll find a point. You tell me where, and we'll we'll go there. Uh, okay, I'm I'm working on it. Okay, since this is a history themed show, um. Yeah, you know, I just want to read some excerpts, and I, I think it would help to um, set up several themes that we will be developing throughout the evening. Um, Okay, let's do the first one. Uh, Large quantities of refuse were cleared out of the city by officials specially appointed for the purpose. All sick persons were forbidden entry, and numerous instructions were issued for safeguarding the public's health, health, but all to no avail. Uh, Against the maladies, it seemed that all the advice of physicians and all the power of medicine were profitless and unavailing. Um, Those people who were treating the illnesses whose numbers had increased enormously because the ranks of the qualified were invaded by people, both men and women who had never received any training in medicine, being ignorant of its causes, were not prescribing the appropriate cure. Uh, what is that? Nor was this the full extent of its evil, for not only did it infect healthy persons who conversed or had any dealings with the sick, making them ill or visiting an equally horrible death upon them, but it also seemed to transfer the sickness to anyone touching the clothes, etc. Um... Or one more page. Moreover, a great many people died who would perhaps have survived had they received some assistance. Uh, as for the common people in a large proportion of the bourgeoisie, they presented a much more pathetic spectacle, for the majority of them were constrained either by their poverty or the hope of survival to remain in their houses. Um, go back page. Um, it did not take. It did not take the form it had assumed in the East, etc. And one more. Um, trying to find the start of, instead of incarcerating themselves, these people moved about freely, holding in their hands a posy of flowers or fragrant herbs or one of a wide range of spices which they applied at frequent intervals to their nostrils. Okay. Probably the last one would uh, give you an idea of the historical event I've uh, been reading about. But you know, the first six quotes you know, could have been taken from almost any magazine, newspaper, or TV headline from anywhere in the world from the last 16 months. But... You know, these uh, passages um, do talk, you know, may seem like, you know, uh, or one of today's journalists could, could be covering something about isolated seniors, virus mutations, denied travel, uh, quack doctors, shelter in place, lockdown versus open states, and, you know, the flowers, uh, 
were kind of like a face covering instead of a mask. And you know, those quotes come from uh, Boccaccio's Decameron, which he started in the 1350s after the plague of 1348 through 50. Um, so... When you know, the Rona appeared, did medical professionals just repeat how Florentines responded to the pandemic? Has healthcare has healthcare's reaction to a pandemic remained the same for seven hundred years? So, which brings us to when Plandemic appeared, we only had a few minutes to watch it before the fact-checkers censored it. And there were uh, a lot of parallels, differences between the uh, plague and the Rona. Uh, Charlie, you followed the science, and you wanted to say something about that documentary. So I'll, I'll come back about midnight and tell you that the show's over. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. I just had Dr. Judy Mikovits on my, my group podcast, The Union of the Unwanted, last night. And she went off for like an hour straight before she had to run to do another interview. And uh, <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so we we let her we just turned her loose and let her go. She, mm -hmm. you know, she she talk about the science. You know, it's an interesting concept because I think before all of this, there was this monolithic idea of science, and it was the scientific method, and all of these people are professionals, and everybody's working off of the same facts, and they're conducting actual experiments and. And this is the honest-to-God truth about what the science is and all that stuff. And what we've discovered over the last 10 months is that there's different variations of science. There is traditional science, and there is paid-for science. There's bot science. And I think that a lot of people that don't, you know, that, are, that aren't into the sorts of topics that we talk about on, on, on my show or on your shows, they're not – they're of the opinion that it's just still all one big block of science. And they haven't, it hasn't occurred to them that it is just as easy to buy a scientist as it is to buy a politician. And I would suggest that mm. most politicians have already been bought. And, and I think that most people think that, well, a scientist would never, would never do that. They would never sell out. But when, it, when, when you dig into the, you know, the medical industry, and especially the, the industries that are tied to universities, what you find is that a lot of these scientists spend half of their time looking for money, going out and trying to find mm -hmm. it from whoever will give it to them. And it might be, it, and, and whoever controls that money has a, by default, has an influence over them. Now, you could get your money from a very nice, wealthy, older gentleman who just is interested in science and maybe funds your research because they like your style or they like what you're doing or whatever. And that could be, you could just have almost no oversight, take that money and get to work and do your thing. Or you can take your money from Jeffrey Epstein, which happens quite a bit, and then you're under his thumb. Or you can take your money from Anthony Fauci, who is the candy man when it comes to financially, uh, you know, sprinkling and spreading his money around. He, he's in charge of over $3 billion a year. He has been giving that money out to a lot of institutions for a very long time. They depend on it. They need it. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing inherently wrong with them needing money, and there's nothing wrong with them getting money from somebody. The problem is when all of a sudden the guy that gives you the money is being put on a pedestal and – treated and given godlike status the way Fauci was over the last year, you're not in a position to, <clears throat> to criticize that person unless you have to start your search for money all over again. Maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you're close to getting to the point where you, you know, you're figuring out what it is you're working on, and you can't do that. So there's a, there's a control component here 
that has um, infected the scientific community. And it's made all of these scientists, it, it, it's introduced the possibility that they could have competing motives for their work. They could, they could be the best scientists and the most ethical scientists in the world, but also realize, if I say something bad about this guy, there goes my money. And maybe uh -huh. they've got a team to think about as well. And the team, you know, hey, the, we're all out of work. So there are a lot of people that had a lot of questions about Anthony Fauci, ha have been since back in, his, in, in the AIDS days, back in the 80s. A lot of people questioning him. But they were put in a position where they can't publicly speak about it because they're financially incentivized to not do so. So, <clears throat> so this, this year that we've lived through, it has been a real wake-up call, I think, to a lot of people, at least those with the eyes to see it, that, that science has some blind spots and that you can manipulate the outcomes and, the, and, and you, you can manipulate the science based on how much money you have. We've watched Bill Gates do that with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, sprinkle money around not just the scientific endeavors but also to the media. And then, once again, it's the same component. How, how are you going to run a – a hit piece on the guy that just gave you millions of dollars. So it's hard to do that. Right. But there's there's mm -hmm. a couple of things happening. There's 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 a lot of money flowing through this, and that's what I think more of like the 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 typical American thinks. Well, I'm just looking at this from a scientific standpoint, and hopefully all the science adds up. And I'm not a scientist, so I have to defer to these guys, and and I hope that they're being honest with me about this very important pandemic that we're going through it's got to be the biggest priority right surely the money wouldn't influence it well 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 wait the money is influencing it it is it is playing a huge role in what we've gone through over the last year and a half almost so so i think it's it's worth people waking up to the fact that uh we have to differentiate how we label science and we have to acknowledge that when you have, like anything, when you have a lot of money flowing through, you have the potential for some conflicts of interest, you have uh, deception, you have greed, you have hubris, you have all these things, and, and, and arrogance, too. Like, the, you know, let's not forget that doctors have a bit of a, you know, they, they get a bit of a God complex. They are, they are, in some cases, instrumental in preventing death. They, they have, you know, they have a... Some of them have an inflated ego. Some of them have an, an ego that is that they are that's worthy of having. You know, if you've brought somebody back to life, you <laughs> it's kind of hard to uh, you know it's kind of hard to question that person. So so the the idea that doctors are above reproach, that that, that scientists are above reproach, that everybody is operating um, ethically and morally, I mean, I think that's a bit naive. And 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 over the last year plus, we've seen people have to come to this realization that a lot of the science is questionable and a lot of the things that mm -hmm. we're being told are being changed uh, midstream you know um the, the cdc's changing masks. you know yeah changing masks they're changing the definition of herd immunity on their website you know right before they launched the vaccine program so there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, manipulation happening and and they've done a masterful job i should say of conflating that that if you want to criticize the, 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 what's happening here, or if you just have questions about what's happening here, you're anti-science. You are a conspiracy theorist, mm -hmm. you're anti-science, and you're dangerous, and you probably want to kill grandma. So that doesn't work on me. It doesn't work on a lot of the people that I know, but it does work on some people. It will get you to stop talking about certain things if you are afraid that you might be – you might be labeled as somebody that is counterproductive to this uh, all hands on deck, we've all got to get, come together and save the world type of, of thing that we've gone through. So it's, it's not just the science that's happening. It's a psychological operation that's happening in conjunction with the media. And it is, it is you know, horrible that we've gone through this, and, 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 I, and my heart goes out to anybody that is died from this is the families surrounding that it, it you know none of that is good but but i would i will say that from a just a pure observational standpoint it is it has been the most fascinating case study in how media manipulation works 
how social engineering is 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 rolled out the the trust factor when you put a white lab coat on somebody and 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 just how you can control people and manipulate them through fear yeah and it, uh, you could just grab someone off the street put a white lab coat on them you know uh, maybe uh, so, so so some you know, just make up a name uh, dr so, you know, dr Robinson and yep. yeah just just have the uh, person just talk about you know uh, hey if you if you want a cure for something uh, just squeeze cucumber juice all over you and, and people yep. will believe it uh, but you know it, if I would just say that here people say oh that's pretty uh, typical inane comment for Mark to say, and uh, I'd expect that. But, uh, it, you know, it's just, it, it, uh, you know, probably uh, in a little bit we can get into, you know, like, some of these dualities about, hey, you know, one person says something, it's good. And, and, you, know, uh, you know, it's like, almost like... Uh, uh, you know, when the uh, pandemic first started, you know, people said, oh, you, I mean, just take uh, hydroxy. Uh, that, that was quickly, uh, you know, uh, one group of people say, oh, that, 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 that's not going to work at all. You, you need the vaccine. It, 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 it mm-hmm. was just be, the, the science, it was just changing all the time. And, you, you know, you had Dr. Judy on last you were just talking to her last night, and, like, you know, she has a uh, plague of um, corruption. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she, she got a lot of heat for that. She was, yep. Um, you know, if you say something different than the narrative, uh, you're going to be uh, punished for it. Yeah. For sure, and it brings me back to the idea of the Milgram experiment, where you where you put somebody in a lab coat and tell them, you know, crank this little thing, the crank the knob up, and uh, if the person in the next room gets the answer wrong, and they get the answer wrong, and you crank the crank the knob up and shock them, and these people are shocking the person in the next room, thinking increasing the voltage every time they miss the answer, and they're saying, I don't want to do this anymore, and the guy with the lab coat and the you know and the clipboard says, listen you got to do it. You're going to mess up the whole experiment if you don't. So the people just keep doing it. And it's so we, we, we think we have this independent thought. Maybe some people do more so than others. But what we've come to understand is that in the face of authority, you sometimes wilt if you're not completely convinced of your position. And, and, and considering most of us aren't scientists, myself included, when you have a doctor or a scientist on the, on the national news in front of you saying, "This is what we need to do. This is the studies. We've been I've been working on this forever, and this is how you handle it." I mean, who are we to say, you know, who are we to say no, right? We we don't know. We don't know the 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 difference. But so a lot of us default and, and defer to these mm-hmm. to the experts. And 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 I would say that most of the time in life, when you do that, things work out fine. You take your car to a mechanic because you're not a mechanic, and the mechanic says you need a new transmission, and you know that they might be lying to you, but you wind up getting the new transmission and you know because you're not going to do it yourself, and so that's just the way it gets done. So we're, we're already sort of pre-trained to do that. And when we have a huge situation like this that, that requires the, the big brains to come in and sort it all out, then you get most of the people in, in, you know, that are turning on their TV, they're just nodding along going, okay, well, if you say so, we've all done it. We all have to do it to some extent. But, right. but, but a, as things go on, you start to – I mean, I feel like it, what, where, it, where it went south was that if we decided that – we would say, okay, that's fine. We hear what you're saying, and you, you might be true. You know, it might be what you're saying might be correct, and, and, and that might be the best solution. But can we talk about some other alternatives? Can we talk about hydroxychloroquine? No, can't talk about. It. Well, why not? You know, well, because it's it's mm-hmm. not going to work here. Well, how do we know it's not going to work here? I mean, if this is a pandemic and everybody's going to die, 
then why, why, why aren't we allowed to talk about all the options? Why did the media never mention to us, go out, okay, the vaccine is coming, we're working on it as fast as we can, we have the brightest minds working on it, but in the absence of that, and in the meantime, here are some simple steps you can do to boost your immunity. You can go outside, you can get exercise, you can eat right, you can take vitamin D, you can take zinc, you can, you can do all. We never heard any of that. I mean, right. the only thing the mainstream media said was just wait till the vaccine, stay in your house and wait till the vaccine arrives. Then everyone will be fine. And I found that to be totally dishonest. And I found that to be incongruent with, like, reality and medical advice and logic and common sense and all of that. And when you couldn't question anything, when you were, when you were not allowed to question I, I felt like that, to me, should be the biggest indicator that you should definitely be questioning things. If you're, if you're told that you, you can't talk about hydroxychloroquine, then the, the question is why. Is it dangerous? Is it going to kill everyone? They're like, no, it doesn't work. You can't talk about it. All right, well, if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. What's the big deal? Why are you so freaked out that we're talking about Why are you banning people on social media for talking about it? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, does it have anything to do with it? It's a, it's a generic that Big Pharma can't make a bunch of money from? I mean, is that part of it? Because if that's what it is, and you're burying this potential cure, maybe, I don't know if I would say cure, but you're, you're a, a treatment, then that's, that's horrendous. That's, that's media malpractice, which is really kind of par for the course with them. But, but I, all of these things that, you, that you, we would notice, because like if we weren't, Super, I wasn't super invested in this. I wasn't out there telling people to wear masks or telling people to get vaccinated or telling people to stay in their homes or calling the police if they had too many people in the, in the neighbor's drive. I wasn't doing any of that. I was just watching. And what I was watching was a, I was watching an unnatural reaction to this. I was watching the suppression of potential uh, treatments for this. I was watching people get not just ridiculed but outright depersoned off of – YouTube, and Facebook, and Twitter, and Instagram, and all of these places that you, you, you just, you literally could not even have the conversation. Even if the conversation was going to be, I don't think this is going to be the right solution, um, but, you know, we're talking about, you weren't even allowed to talk about it. So that, to me, is a red flag, and it just, it's, it's, it's an indicator that they, they were hiding something. Yeah, and, and, short, um I think it was towards the end of uh, pandemic where uh, she, she was saying you, know, you can take uh, what vitamin uh, D and zinc. Yeah, and it, it, in, in the early stages, well, you know, that was probably one of the um, reasons it was taken uh, off YouTube. Every time it, it was uh, put up, but you know, they also said, you know, uh, "Stay in your house." Oh, don't you go outside? Well, uh, you know, one of the best and cheapest sources of vitamin D just comes from the sun. So, right, uh, right there, you know. The, you know, if we're supposed to follow the science, well, how are we supposed to trust the people in the white coats if, you know, you're just making up stuff that doesn't even make sense? You know, you learn about this, like, vitamin D in, what, like, maybe ninth grade science class? Yeah. And, the, and these yeah. people who yeah. are MDs aren't even uh, – uh, cognizant of that, they're just more concerned about. Uh, hey, uh, don't you know, don't uh, build up your uh, immune system. We're gonna have we're gonna put together some kind of cocktail over the weekend, and we're gonna get shots in arms. So uh, mm-hmm. it, 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 the, the, the this whole thing. Uh, pandemic thing it ha- hasn't really added up, and you know, your discussion with you know, Dr. Judy, I'm sure she had all kinds of 
more personal stories about her, how how she was um, is on the lamb basically. Yeah, <laughs> they hate her. They don't want her talking yeah. about anything. It, 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 but it's what's the problem a, with the truth? It, it, that's a really good question. What is the problem with the truth? Well, the truth exposes the lies, of course, and the lies are extremely profitable. The profit motive for the pharmaceutical industry is massive. So they have – so they were subsidized for the research and development of the vaccine – because the government just said, here, we're going to give them billions of dollars, and uh, this is going to get them, you know, give them a head start. Then they were financially protected by the emergency use authorization clause, which gave them immunity. Then they got, mm -hmm. I don't know, several billion dollars worth of free advertising from the mainstream media. Then they got $3 billion worth of free advertising from the government who said, we are taking this money in this one of these last stimulus packages, and we're going to use this for vaccine education. So they got a free marketing campaign out of it. And, and they, they – and, you know, so they have – it's nothing but free money for them. I mean, I've seen, you know, the meet the six new Moderna billionaires. <laughs> I saw that article mm -hmm. in, like, Wall Street Journal yep. or something. Excuse me, but I don't want to meet the six new Moderna billionaires. You know, I, I have a question for them. How how are you guys all billionaires when you failed to 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 bring eight products to market? This is your first quote vaccine, and it's not a vaccine. You shouldn't be billionaires at all. You should be all looking for new jobs. Your company is garbage. You're not doing what you say you do. You you can't get a mark a product to market. So why is the government subsidizing this? So the whole thing has been. Just one inconsistency after another, and I think that – I wonder um, if after all of this, people will sort of come to that realization. I don't expect everybody to, obviously. My expectation level is rather low for the masses of humanity out there to figure out that they're being conned, but, um, but, but can't some – percentage of the population wake up to this? I mean, a couple of months ago, as an example, the CDC just arbitrarily said, well, the, the social distancing, we're cutting it from six feet down to three feet. And everyone was like, oh, that's great. And I was, I, I, you know, raised my, virtually raised my hand and said, so has it, ever, has everything, has this virus gotten half as deadly? Does it travel half as far? Like, where where, explain to me the logic behind cutting this in half. So it, now it, it doesn't – it only goes three feet. It doesn't go three feet now. I mean it, it doesn't make any sense. And so, but it, so it, you get enough it, of it, these and you start to question it. Yeah, and, and I was just going to say in, in the grocery store, you know, you're supposed to be six feet uh, between the, pers the person in the checkout line ahead of you. But – you know, what if the aisle next to you is only three feet away? So does right. the germ not know how to move sideways? So well, that's correct. There, there, the germ, the but, germ only goes one direction, as we know from, from the, the, the supermarket aisles as well. You go this direction down one aisle, and then you go – I mean, it's, the whole thing is preposterous. And what's, what, what, I don't know what's more frustrating – the, the inconsistent and insane rules that they've put together or the people out there actively enforcing them and pretending that they make any sense. I mean, they're both dangerous to me as, as far as I'm concerned, but, but, you know, I noticed this when I was getting on a plane. It's like you've got to have your mask on. You've got to have, you know, you get, you got to, when you're in the, the, the lobby area waiting to get on your plane, you know, every other seat has like a big sticker, like don't sit in this seat. And you're like, okay, okay, I'm going to keep my distance from the person next to me for, for the, the next 15 minutes until you board me on the plane. And then that person is sitting four inches from, you know, on my right side, four inches on my left. I've got someone behind me. I've got someone in front of me and a, and a, and a stewardess coming down the aisles breathing all over me. But, yeah, that – and – but, mind you, we're in an airplane that when you look up above – Still has the the icons for the for the smoking and non-smoking section. So if you remember back then, they used to allow people to smoke on the planes and pretend like, oh, it'll just stay. We're gonna pull the drape across, you know, so the smoke will stay in this section. It's like, give me a break. So nothing makes sense. And 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 for 
you know, for calmly, which I rarely am, but calmly and logically pointing this out, I am rewarded by being called anti-science or uh, a conspiracy theorist for, for simply pointing out the rather obvious flaws in their logic. And, and it's, it's, it's just strange. It's just a strange concoction of, uh, of fear and authority and obedience and, you know, and I think most of the people out there are uh, mean well, you know, I, I, I really, I, I really do. They, they annoy me to no end, but I think most of the people out there feel like they're finally able to help. They're going to help out. You know, we, we're in the middle of this pandemic and, and, and I can't solve it because I'm not a scientist, but I sure, I sure can, can do my part. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll just be the enforcer. I'll go around and tell people, you, you need to pull your mask up over your nose, or you need to, you know, hey, mm-hmm. hey, have you, have you been vaccinated yet? You know, like, first of all, if we, went in a, if we just went, got in our time machine and went back just two years, somebody walked up to you in the grocery store and asked you if you were vaccinated, you'd be like, well, what are you talking about? How dare you? Like, this is a totally weird and offensive question. It's none of your business. We've normalized form of insanity where, where people feel – not only like confident in their ability to, they feel like a duty and obligation to go question total strangers about what their medical history is. And that to me is just bizarre, but I blame the media for that. And I, and of course I blame the population that's going along with this because this is, this is not, obviously this is not something normal. You don't, you don't do that. We, hell, we have HIPAA laws <laughs> that say you can't do that. Like legally, you can't do that. Oh, we'll throw them out. You know, don't worry about that. We're going to mm-hmm. mandate vaccines at work. It's like, wait, what? No, you're not. You're not doing any of that. That I mean, or they? Oh, oh. So they've been approved. Well, no, they haven't been approved. Okay, so you're going to mandate an experimental, uh, an experiment, a medical experiment that will more than likely nullify your insurance policy, your life insurance policy, uh, you're going to mandate that in order to work at some place? That is like a lawsuit waiting to happen. And yet here we are having that discussion, and people are actually trying to uh, make that argument, that, that that's fine, that it's okay to do that. With a, with a virus, that, mind you, that is, has a 99.98% survivability rate, that's according to the CDC. It's not my figures, and they recently had to change it because it was 99.97, and they had to bump it up one one-hundredth of a percentage point. So it's like all of this just from a, you know, if you, were, if you can get somebody to take the fear out of the equation, that's a huge thing. But, it, you know, if you can just take the fear out and you just lay it out there in a logical manner, and ask them, look at this. Tell me if this makes any sense to you. I feel like you can maybe get through to people, but as long as the fear is there and the media is pushing it, then you're going to get people making decisions from the worst possible place, like from a fight-or-flight position where they can't take a long-term approach. They feel like, well, there's no point in worrying about long term if i don't make it through the next five minutes uh who cares what the you know what the long term uh, applications are that this is this is right now we have to do you take the vaccine yes or no right now we need to know right now why what, what i'm not allowed to research it i'm not allowed to look into this i'm not so everything about it is just rushed and unsustainable and 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 there's a lot of questions about it and and that's and that should be a normal thing, but but where it gets weird is that you are not allowed to ask questions, and that to me is just a huge red flag. Yeah, and you know, you get like maybe January of this year, where um, is start getting these um, reports that, uh, you know, the uh, Rona cases are going, still going up. And, but, you know, there's no flu because people are wearing their masks. So it's not, you're not wearing a mask and wearing a mask at the same time. 
And but uh, what, like five months later, maybe a lot of the fear started to change when <clears throat> all those uh, Fauci emails were released, and he said, "You know, those you know, blue masks that you, you know, buy the bundle of twenty of them at, at mm-hmm. the store, uh, they don't work." And no. it, it, even uh, Dr. Judy in her – the case against masks e- even discussed uh, you know, s- some masks may provide some protection against influenza, but the size of this virus may make even the comparison to influ- influenza viruses a faulty one. It, so it, she uh, – uh, well, she wrote that – book uh, uh, when 2020 I'm not um, sure exactly when it came out yeah yeah it, it, it came out in 2020 so uh, about uh, quite a few months uh, you know let's say six seven months prior to um, Fauci's e- e- emails from like g- what January of 2020, where he he, he knew uh, all, all along that the blue masks aren't going to work. That it, it, it was yeah. she, she, so, so she was right, but yeah, yes. she's still going to be criticized. But um, it, 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 it's just one of those it's frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, it, it, it's just the – her being attacked for being right uh, is something that uh, that sh- uh, sh- shouldn't be happened in uh, – sh- shouldn't be happening in – especially in the medical profession. But – Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it should be – the focus should be on the – on on what's correct what's the what's the right answer and if dr judy mm-hmm. has the right answer or if dr fauci has the right answer the 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 goal should be to get the right answer not the the most politically advantageous answer not the one that's the right for the agenda or that creates the most fear or or mitigates the the fear just the correct one that's that should be the you know what what it reminded me the whole the whole apparatus was based on testing they chose the pcr test was the wrong testing that you would use for that you've carried mm-hmm. Dr. carrie mullis who won the nobel prize for inventing the pcr test is on camera saying you know this is not a diagnostic tool this is it's not you don't use now he passed away in 2019 so he wasn't around for this situation i'm sure he would have had some thoughts on it i can guarantee you that but he had a he he had a big problem with Fauci and he said that this test is not to be used for for these these purposes because you can crank up the cycles and you can create false positives and that of course mm-hmm. is what was happening and so people are saying to you you know the average person on the street is saying there's so many cases there's so many cases well so who cares if we're talking about cases if we're using a test that has a 97% false positive rate when you crank it up to 35 cycles, or 35 or more, and that's what was happening. So I don't care about cases if the if the measurement tool is broken. So if we if we can crank it, and we started speculating about this last summer, we were saying, well, watch, we, they'll, they'll roll out the vaccine, and then in line with the vaccine, they'll tell everyone to crank the the, the machines down to 25 cycles and run it there, and then they'll say, oh, look, all the cases went away. See, the vaccine's working. And that's, of course, exactly what they've done. <laughs> so they say, well, <laughs> cases are down. Say, oh, because the vaccine? Well, yeah, that's what they'll say. Yeah, the, yeah, cases are down because of the vaccine. Well, is it is the vaccine the only variable that you that you introduced in here, or did you do something else? Well, well, we changed the cycle threshold from 35 down to 25. Ah, there we go. So that's what we need to be talking about not the vaccines you you mm-hmm. can't so it's like you have to if we're going we're going to compare apples to apples if we you know if you want to do that if you want to introduce the vaccine and then and say we're going to show you how well it works 
then you have to keep the cycles at 35. So it'll, it'll show massive cases, and then it'll show, well, the vaccine isn't doing anything. The cases are still high. But when you marry those two things together, you introduce vaccines, you lower the case or the, the cycle threshold, and then you change, like I mentioned earlier, the CDC's definition of herd immunity. There's, you can find the screenshots of, of it before this happened in November, before the end of November, and after the end of November. They changed it. And the wording that they put in there said that in, now includes that herd immunity is only achieved through vaccination. And that is not accidental. So there's a lot of manipulation of, the, of, of you know, you, there's a lot of ways that you can play with the numbers. And, and, a, and a prime example of that, and one that sent me, you know, off the deep end, happened in August of 2020. And that is when okay. that was the, what happened? The, first, the, the first announcement of, in the papers saying the, talking about the death, the death tolls in the United States. And the very first one, now these days I think they're using 500,000, 600,000. But the very first right. one was 169,000. 169,000 dead Americans so far from COVID. And you, and you go, wow, that's crazy. And then you read the story. And you get to the last paragraph of the story, and it says, of those 169,000 dead people, 94% of them died with COVID, and, 90, and, and 6% died from COVID. So it said that, it said that only 6% were, they were listed with just COVID on the death certificate as the cause of death. The other 94% died with it, with COVID, and on average, 2.6 comorbidity conditions, which could have included heart disease, cancer, and car accidents. So it's like, okay, wait a second. We're, 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 once again, we're, we're, we're comparing apples to kumquats here because there's a difference between dying from it and with it. You know, they were, they were saying anybody that died – They'd go back and, and they'd test them. If somebody had tested positive for COVID 30 days earlier but died of heart disease, they were listed as dying from COVID. And that is, mm -hmm. it, it is totally unscientific. But, it, but it, it builds up the numbers. And then once you get into the fact that you, you see the financial incentivization that happened at the hospitals through uh -huh. um, where they were saying, well, you're going you're to pay 13000 for anybody that dies with COVID or you get paid 39000 for anybody that – that goes on a respirator, and you know, and you're like, well, well, we're going to put everybody on respirators because we can't have our elective surgeries here in the hospital. Everything's shut down. We got to make money. We have bills to pay. Um, yeah, we're just going to. Who cares? We're just going to claim everybody died from COVID, or we're going to put everybody on ventilators it, and things like that. And, but it, uh, and, and that's Doctor Burks uh, coached people to say that. Just hey, if you stub your toe, oh, we're going to diagnose you as ha having the virus. Yeah, yeah. That so, just make up facts. Yeah. So if you see that, and you and if you can get yourself to an objective place where you're not fearful and you're not you don't have a dog in this fight, you just say, "Well, that doesn't sound right to me." And you get just a bunch of these things that don't sound right. Well, that doesn't sound right the way you're calculating the numbers. It doesn't sound right that you're incentivizing hospitals to to start counting people as COVID when they don't have COVID. Um, you know, you're supposed to be all overworked and, and, and exhausted, and yet here we are watching these TikTok videos and YouTube videos of nurses and chore doing choreographed dances, and that doesn't seem right. And, and the Javits Center in New York is open because it's going to be it's going to be swamped with all these in sick people. Nobody was there, and I have friends that are journalists in New York City. They're going hospital to hospital, and they're saying, "Where are all the people? There's no people there." They're interviewing uh, paramedics that are sitting in their, you know, next to their truck and behind the hospital. I say, hey, what are you guys doing? Are you guys swamped here? And the guy's like, we haven't done anything in two days. And they're like, wait a second. What is happening here? So there's a lot of questions. And, and like I said earlier, once you get to a point where, where you have questions, then you start to see that you're not allowed to ask questions anymore. The mere act of asking a question is, is – um, you know, it, it is made to be a parallel to wanting to kill grandma, and it it just seemed it everything about it was is is very incongruent with how you would behave. Trying to say that the virus doesn't exist or that people didn't die from it or anything like that, 
I'm just Understand. trying to say that what they said was going to happen. I mean, you know, we've got the China videos of people just dropping dead and, and things like that. We were expecting bodies, <laughs> you know, stacked on the street and, and the Black Plague. That's what we were told to expect. And we didn't get that. Bring out your Thankfully, dead. Thankfully, we didn't get that. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, 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 but, so when we didn't see that, we started to say, well, is it not as bad as we thought it was going to be? Oh, you can't ask that. You can't. We, we, we've changed the numbering. We've changed the way we count deaths. We've changed the way we count count cycles. I mean, everything got manipulated, and it's and it it's just been a it's just been an interesting you know it's been an interesting study in, in, in how you would go about creating the perception of a pandemic when there really wasn't one. And from a statistical standpoint, there wasn't one. And I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to be disrespectful to anybody that died from, you know, that died from COVID, but there are differences between dying from it and dying with it and, and being, you know, and having pre exacerbating con conditions. Like, like what are the stats that sh I think it was like 60% of people that died were, were obese and, and another large percentage of people were, were 80 years and older. Like it, it, okay, it, well, it was age, age and weight were you know, like the two biggest factors mm -hmm. and yes yeah. you know, so if you have uh, a, a weight problem why aren't the same doctors discussing uh, the, the GMOs in the foods that probably could contributed to you having the weight problem in the first place and you know, do, do we really need the excitotoxins sprinkled on the uh, uh, chips yeah why isn't something yeah, done it, about it, that to help make sure that people are healthy before uh, like a bioweapon is or uh, I'm sorry a pandemic happens <laughs> It, it's a it's a it's a question that I think we've all been thinking about. You know, if if this is so, um, you know, like if we were to rank this that you know the death toll uh, in terms of of what is actually killing people in this country, and we went off of the the real numbers, not the not the not the you know fudged numbers that they're giving us. This this is this is this is not a statistically significant event. It, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for those people that are still clinging to that. It's just not, because six percent is the real number. Six percent of whatever their figures. Now, if that number is five hundred thousand, well, then we're talking about thirty thousand deaths. Every single one of those deaths matters. I'm I, well, again. I'm not trying to be disrespectful of oh, those uh, people no, that you, died. You're, you're, I'm you're just not. trying to put it in a statistical uh, an analysis where. 30,000 people in a country of 340 million over the course of one year in terms of number of deaths is, is, is not much. I mean, smoking kills more than that. Auto accidents kill more than that. Heart disease, cancer, medical malpractice is the third leading cause of death. And I think that doesn't get mentioned enough in, 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 the, in this conversation that, you know, we put the doctors and the nurses on pedestals and they've gone to medical school, most of them, and uh, have done – you know, tremendous things, but, but the third leading cause of death in the United States is the medical industry. So they're not it, perfect. They're, they're, they're uh, practicing on a lot of people. They call it practicing medicine for a reason. <laughs> they're still practicing. Uh, but, but, but the healthcare professionals were, what, the most uh, vaccine hesitant? Oh, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what did they know that uh, we don't know? Why aren't, and why aren't they telling us that there's like supposed to be transparency? I think that they, I think that they know, and I think that they can't say. I think that they, they're. I mean, I, I don't. Maybe not all of them, but I think there's a, there's a segment of, of in the medical industry, that that knows this. That, but the medical industry is like any industry. You know, you've got some people that are just going. You know, that just. That's, they're just doing it the way they've always done it. They haven't given much thought. You, you would assume that the doctors know a ton about vaccines. But you would be incorrect in that assumption. Most doctors had, you know, a little bit of, of, of vaccines in medical school, and then they, and then that was it. 
and now they just get visits from their pharma reps that give them, you know, uh, merchandise <laughs> pens and, and notepads and things like that and say, hey, would you like to, you know, if you, if you vaccinate 63% of your uh, patients, then you're eligible for $400 per person for your your client base, and uh, and so they have a financial incentive to keep the vaccinations high, and so a lot of doctors like the op- just it's just like the opioid, like, like the opioid epidemic, you know, the financial mm-hmm. incentives, you know, yeah. and also the you know companies sending um you know, like twenty million pills to these little Appalachian counties yeah. with uh, 10,000 uh, popul- uh, population. And, yeah, you wonder with, with that many pills, uh, boy, how, how did almost the entire population just become these uh, drug addicts? Yeah. But, Gee, but, I, I wonder yeah, how that like happened. Nuts. Yeah, yeah. How, you know, how, how about the science involved in that? Oh, so... Here we go from the opioid epidemic, which that's flared up again uh, during the pandemic since uh, yes. you know, it's like going through a hair-raising uh, you know, situation can cause someone to um, relapse and yes. you have more overdoses for... Uh, recovering addicts. So it, it, it's, it, you know, you can kind of look at almost those two situations and just wonder about the science, what we're told. Um, I don't see too many doctors uh, going to being held accountable for um writing all the opioid prescriptions. Very few of them. And, and one thing that most yeah. people don't realize, in, in America, well, we're one of two countries that allow pharmaceutical industry to advertise on television, as, long, as well as uh, New Zealand and the United States. We're the only two. But, and so we see all of those ads and how, much, how many billions of dollars are being spent to, to uh, advertise to the consumers. But what we don't realize is that seven times that amount is being spent by the pharmaceutical industry to advertise directly to doctors. So they are getting the doctors to do the dirty work for them. They're getting the doctors indoctrinated into this uh, um, way of mm-hmm. thinking and then letting the doctors who, who have the trust factor that big pharma doesn't have because they're all convicted felons. They've all been found guilty in court of, of felonies and have been, you know, so, so they're convicted felons, but the doctors have the trust. So they, they, they work directly with the doctors to get them to prescribe, you know, Zimbalta or Gelsons or some new thing that, that's come out. And so they get the, the customers from both ends. They get them on TV saying, ask your doctor if this is right for you. Then you go ask your doctor and the doctor's like, oh, yeah, that's right for you, <laughs> you know, because as much advertising as you've gotten, that doctor's gotten seven times more advertising. So he's totally in it. So it's, plus, there's plus a the lot incentive. going on behind the scenes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the trip Weird to, uh, or, yeah, the trip to Aruba in February. Well, who, who don't want to be mm-hmm. there? Yeah, yeah. We're going to need you to speak for 30 minutes at this conference. Bring your wife and kids and everybody, and then uh, you'll be here for the rest of the week, and we'll see you at dinners, uh, you know, at night and for the luau and all that stuff. And then, isn't that fun? <laughs> Keep up the good work. And how? how and yeah, I like uh, you know, West Virginia's governor, uh, who has resorted to bribing people oh we'll get you all oh, the f- fancy pickup truck or free college tuition and you know put you in this pool and uh you know someone's going to win a million dollars and you know you have all these goodies for you free free passes to the state parks and all this sort of stuff but you need to get uh vaccinated first yeah. Yeah. So uh, Just ask uh, yourself, is that normal? <laughs> you yeah. Know? I mean, they, they've resorted to bribing people. 
it, yeah. it, even though there's like what a 99.7 percent uh, chance that you're going to survive anyways, and what what uh, you, know, you could be like this is the most horrific illness ever known to mankind throughout the annals of history. And, um, you know, you, you see a lot of people saying, oh, dude, I, I don't know, I had it, I must be asymptomatic. So if you can't even tell you're sick, <laughs> what a scam. why do you need – Yeah, then how – then why do you think you need to be bribed with, with the possibility of getting free college tuition? With, so, with this, it's, it, 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 if yeah. you just get the shot, you, you, you'll, you'll be patriotic. But but tr- Trump was cured of it within a couple of days, and that was even before the vaccine even came out. Yeah. So is that just a show? Yeah. Yeah, it's a show. <laughs> it's a sh- the whole thing has been like a gigantic show. It's like the Truman Show, except we're we're all participants in it. You know, when you when you when you incentivize people, I mean, it's can you, Mark? I feel like if we if we pe- got a chance to peek into the 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 big meeting that they were having, I feel like there was a conversation that that happened at some point where they said, uh, where someone on high had all the governors in there, and they said, listen. Just do whatever you need to do to get these people vaccinated. I don't care if you've got to give away – I don't care if you've got to enter them in a lottery. Just get them vaccinated. And then they sent them all the governors out, and they're like, hmm, that's a good idea. Let's do lotteries. Let's do lottery tickets. Let's do free beer. Let's do free donuts. Let's do free – hey, two laps around Talladega Speedway. You know, and they also – you get the feeling they said, what do dumb people like? Let's find out. What do dumb people – dumb people like beer and, 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 and lottery tickets – and NASCAR, you know, you just you can just steal them. Just saying, like, let's appeal to the lowest common denominator here, and let's just go. Let's give them all the free things that they like. Like they like weed, right? Let's give them weed. Some of them want to go to college. Yeah. Not many of them, but we can maybe offer them, you know, college scholarship. Six pack. Some of them. Some of the smart. The six six pack. Hey, Sam Adams will give you free beer. Like, like just <laughs> take a step back and think about it logically. You're in the middle of a deadly pandemic. Everybody's dying. The only cure is the vaccine, and you have to bribe people with donuts and beer and Talladega laps in order to get them to take it. This is not working well. <laughs> this is this, the wheels have come off of this narrative, and they're desperate to try and uh, glue them back on because they want everybody vaccinated. And, and, and I also, you know, I, I just ask people like, you know, my friends that aren't really into this and I, you know, they talk about this stuff and I say, let me ask you something. This government of yours, of ours, they invent new in, in ingenious ways to tax you, to take as much of your money as they can. Every year they come up with new ways to do it. They are trying to screw you over in one way or another. Why do you think – now all of a sudden they care about you, a government that goes out of their way to put you in a cage or criminalize everything or take away your freedoms and sell them back to you in the form of licenses and things like that. They care about you. They care about you so much that they want you to take this medical experiment, and they're willing to give you lottery tickets for it. Like, you know, mice get stuck in the mouse trap because they can't ever figure out why the cheese is free. And I feel like humanity needs to figure out why the cheese is just sitting there. <laughs> and, and we're watching it going, I wouldn't touch that cheese if I were you. And, and yet people are still going, but it's, but it's free. In fact, if I take that cheese, they're going to give me a lottery ticket. And it's like, really? Is that how it works? And you go to get the cheese and boom, it's over for it. You know, so, so it's, it's in, in some respects, it's a bit of a litmus test to see just where, just how gullible people really are, and just to see what will make them take the next step. I mean, it, look, personally, Mark, I'm holding out for four laps around Talladega. I don't know about you, but I have standards. So, well, uh, uh, maybe Ricky Bobby could ride with you to <laughs> enhance. <laughs> 
That's but, that's what's happening in the fall. If they can't get the, they're bringing out Ricky Bobby. It's it's just laughable, you know. And and if you and for pointing this out, for just laying out the the obvious insanity of it all, just mentioning this, you, you will be treated. You will be treated poorly. You will be treated like the enemy, like somebody that is. You, you will be treated like somebody that is conspiring to give everybody coronavirus. You know what I mean? Not 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 just somebody that has questions. You you would be treated as the enemy, and it is. It's 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 weird, and it's and it's really dangerous because I, I'm not afraid of the virus, but I'll tell you what I'm I'm more afraid of. I'm afraid of the general public. And the general public, you know, in large groups, uh, whipped up into a frenzy by the mainstream media. They're, that's a dangerous group, and so I, I have, uh, you know, I have questions about uh, about all of these people, and and so um, so here you know here we are just kind of, kind of pointing this out in, in an attempt to, I don't know, get people to think. And God, they just don't want to think. They just don't want to do it. But it you know, uh, Charlie, with um, your discussion with Dr. Judy last night, what you said tonight um, on the show that nearly got me fired, um you know the uh, you know <clears throat> your other media appearances. Um, I'm sure you have like really, and, and you know what you've said tonight. Um, you have to be um, really embarrassed about having such a bottom of the barrel social score. <laughs> um and what I was kind of leading into you know, eventually kind of working into your book but you want I think one of the things that um I always remember about the last fifteen, sixteen months is it, this fascinating duality. Um, you, know, you, you can look at Trump sent the naval hospital to New York. Cuomo sends uh, people from the hospital back into nursing homes. You know the lockdown states versus uh, the no mandatory mask uh, states, um, the emergency approved versus not FDA approved. Um, uh, it, there's just uh, so, so many, uh, no masks means that you're a rebel. Masks. Mm -hmm means that you're loyal to the ideology. Portland, hey, you get a free pass, but the uh, January 6th insurrectionists must be hunted down and jailed. Yeah. I, 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 there's, I, I, you could just sit, sit, sit there and just go, uh, yeah, uh, a ma MAGA rally is... Uh, declared a super spreader event immediately after it's over and you know 90 percent of the people uh they all tested positive but you can riot and loot in portland in close quarters mm -hmm. there's not one documented rona case uh, it's right. just i mean it, it, there's just so many um these inconsistencies have created a a, a duality. It's basically like night and day. You know, the good good yeah. guys versus bad guys. When all of you know the the last fifteen sixteen months together as 
a whole, you know, relive, uh, you know, just go back in a time, time machine and it, just look at everything. Um, are the, you know, riots, the George Floyd thing, and the January 6th insurrection, uh, uh, whatever happened to the Nashville bombing, mail-in ballots, <laughs> and of course, uh, you know, the coronavirus, are they all interrelated? I, I feel like they are. Well, they, they are in the sense that you're being told how to feel about all of them by the media. And the media drives the narrative. Of course, they're being told what to say by groups like the Atlantic Council and CFR and Bilderberger and you know, Trilateral Committee, all, all, those, all the NGOs and think tanks that, that really sort of manage these things from behind the scenes. They're instructing the media, not just the traditional mainstream media, but also social media in terms of what they can and can't allow, what is acceptable to talk about. You know, they give you the, the narratives and the, and the sort of the guidelines and, the, you know, and anything that falls outside of that is, um, is to be viewed one way and anything that falls inside of that is to be viewed as the truth. So you, I used to always think that when you know, people would say, oh, the mainstream media is liberal, like 20 years ago I would hear like, oh, the liberal media and everything. And I just thought that was a complaint that conservatives had that it was just mm -hmm. their way of complaining about the media. But that's, it's actually true. The, the media is, is very liberal, very, very left-leaning. And, and, yeah, of course, there's Fox News and, and, and all that. But, but, but as a whole, the media leans left. So when the media is in charge of telling you the story, they can shape that story however they want. And so when it comes to large groups of people outside all together in close proximity, then it depends – on who's who's there at the event it doesn't it's like it's not the event itself that is dangerous or not dangerous it depends solely on why everybody is at the event they are there to celebrate donald trump it's a super spreader event if they are there to mm -hmm. celebrate the victory of joe biden it's fine and it's not a it's 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 uh, a time for everyone to get out of their house and and it's it's okay the cdc literally said that if you are protesting for – in the George Floyd situation, that that is more important than social distancing because the social implications of that are more important than the coronavirus thing. So automatic disqualification oh, for them for whatever they say from that point on because when they tell you that, when they politicize the science, then it's no longer science. It's dogma. And, and so mm -hmm. we saw that. We saw the science get manipulated, and it all depends on, the, on who is, is, is sharing that message. And if it's the mainstream media, then the George Floyd ri riots aren't riots. They're pe mostly peaceful protests. As the, cam I mean, as the guy with the microphone is <laughs> standing in front of the camera is saying that, there's, bur the building, there's a building behind the guy on fire. And he's saying mostly peaceful protests. It's the most preposterous thing you, you will ever see. And, 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 and of course, we, we call that out, and we're called uh, right-wingers for that. I'm not on either side. I don't care about either one of these sides. I'm not, I'm not on the right team or the left team. I don't, I, I'm not playing that game. I'm just acknowledging and being, trying to be as objective as I can and say, well, you know, that's a riot. That, that's, I, I, I was at USC in 92 going to school when the Rodney King riots went through. I know what a riot looks like. I've been, I've been unfortunately, been, they're scary. They're, it, it's very unpredictable. There's fire. There's smoke everywhere. You want to get out of that place as fast as possible. The term mostly peaceful protesters, I can assure you, never went through my mind. The only thing that went through my mind was these people may very well kill me. I need to get out of here. So, uh, so when the media is saying that they're mostly peaceful protesters, that w they're lying. And so, when they when they say that the the Trump situation is a is a super spreader event, or when they say January sixth is a is is you know is, is is some sort of insurrection thing, 
it's semantics. It's, I just, it, it just depends on who's telling you the story. Because if the media is telling you the story, believe me, they're going to have, they're going to tell you one way to look at it. And that's not going to be necessarily the truth. It's just going to be the way they want you to feel about it. And the reason why they want you to feel that way is because it's part of this massive agenda. And the agenda is to get you to only feel one way if you get outside of the established uh, narrative, then the social media platforms have been given the green light to, to deplatform you, and mainstream media has been given the free reign to call you every sort of name in the book and to marginalize you and, and label you as crazy for having the audacity to call a riot a riot. And so, it, it, but and this is a, there's a term for that, and it's called gaslighting. And and of course. Most people didn't know that term until a couple of years ago, and now everybody knows it. And the reason why they know it is because it, it's happening on a daily, hour-to-hour basis uh, when it comes to the, to the media. They just can't stop lying. They, they don't want to stop lying, but even if they wanted to, they can't. They, they are pot committed. They are, uh, to borrow a poker term, they have all of their chips in because th- – they are, they, are, they, have, they are selling a story, a version of reality that does not exist, and they can't for a minute let you think that they might not be telling you the truth, which, of course, they aren't. But you, because it, it, any sort of let up, you'll, you'll go, wait a second, I, I, don't, I don't think this is right. This doesn't, you know, the emperor, you know, the emperor has no clothes. And they're like, no, 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 he, he's got all his clothes on. Believe me. Trust me. It's like, well, I can't trust the media on anything. I don't trust them. I don't trust the weather report. You know what I mean? It's gotten to the point where I'm so I'm so <laughs> jaded where I just can't even like like oh, it's partly cloudy tomorrow. I'm like, ah, it'll be sunny. It'll be sunny. I know it. You know. So so I mean, I'm, I'm kind of being facetious, but 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 the point is that you know when you lose your credibility, like the media has, it's tough to get it back, and they have done nothing to earn it. To earn earn it uh, to earn any sort of trust, so I watch it from time to time, not to get informed, but just to hear what they're saying. You know, to 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 understand what version of reality they're trying to sell, and 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 where my frustration grows. Well, obviously, I don't appreciate being lied to by the by the media or anyone for that matter. But where my my real frustration is 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 the general public that just watches the news or reads something online and they just accept it at face value. Now, we in the alter, you know, conspiracy world, um, mm-hmm. we're guilty of that too. Um, we're guilty of, of, certain, of, of our own biases. And, you know, we want to, well, oh, see, there we go. That's just what I said. You know, just what I thought. It, you know, they're doing this again. So we have to be better about that as well. But, but I, I just have such a, a, an, an utter contempt for the media. Not, not because you know, not for nothing, really. Because they, they, they've been Except lying for, for a long light. time. I, I love nightlight, of course, but, but that's uh, different. Okay, good. We're talking about we're get, we're getting into the we're getting into the the real sort of uh, you know the the dark, uncomfortable truths that they don't want to talk about. But the but the the media has just has done such a, you know, it's one thing if they just, you know, if they lie to you about this brand of car is is better than that brand of car, you know, that's one thing. But the lies that they tell have real world implications for us. They, it, it, in some cases, life and death. And and you're making decisions. You know, you might be making a decision on a vaccine based on something, some story that you saw on CNN and and you go, well, you know, I like Anderson Cooper. He seems like a nice guy. And surely he wouldn't be telling me, you know, he wouldn't be misleading me about this. And then you go, well, you know, maybe Anderson Cooper is a nice guy, but the pharmaceutical industry is paying CNN billions of dollars for advertising. And, you know, that influences what they can and can't talk about. So, so the media has, some sort they have conflicts of interest when it comes to advertisers especially like big pharma where where you, where you take like the the average guy on the street who who you know if you want to say well what do you think about the vaccine situation they say well i've heard nothing but good things about it 
you know, and, and you say, well, you know, did you know that there's another side to the story, that there's some, there's some real questions about it? I, well, that guy will say, I didn't know that. I didn't see that on TV. I don't think that's right. And you go, well, well wait a second. So you're waiting for the, the nightly news that gets 60% of their ad revenue from the pharmaceutical industry. You're waiting for the nightly news to give you an unbiased vaccine when they have so much of their money tied up in, in pleasing and keeping and retaining these advertisers, like I find that to be incredibly naive that people would sit around and think, well, if, surely if, the, if there was some downside to these vaccines, Anderson Cooper would have told me about it. And since he hasn't told me about it, then there must not be a problem. It's like, it's like that's, a, that's a big assumption to make. You know, so so the role of the media in all of this has me, oh, you know, so frustrated. But I, but it's it's, I'm I'm not placing all of the blame at their feet, most of it. But but I still reserve a little bit of my frustration for the general public who has to do a better job of getting honest about their relationship with the media, and they need to do a much better job of doing their own research for themselves because if they outsource their critical thinking to these people at CNN and MSNBC and the BBC and Fox News, uh, they're in for a, a rude awakening when they find out that maybe the things that, the, that they are being told on their nightly news um, are not exactly accurate. Okay, Charlie, um, you know, you're covering – you know, the pharmaceutical industry is um, paying whatever media outlet to advertise. Um, it, it, you, know, you did mention earlier uh, about uh, the Bilderberg Group, the trilateralists. Um, you... Know, you go into far more uh, detail about their agendas uh, in in your um, the the controlled demolition of the American Empire so what you know let's just uh, take take any one of those groups what are they doing How, uh, you know, as we've you know, kind of joked around a little bit about uh, some of the example you know we're serious about all things too but when you look at all this stuff that's gone on for the last 15 months um, is there a group behind all this insanity that we've been forced to endure yeah yeah and it's actually it's it's actually not the trilateral commission or bilderberg or or cfr or any of those though they are involved but they're not the driving factor here. The driving, the driving force is the World Economic Forum. And that is for people that have heard that term but aren't sure. Davos. You would hear the Davos group. That's uh, Davos, Switzerland right. is where they're based mm -hmm. in, and led by Klaus Schwab, who started the group in the early 70s. And uh, this is the group that is at the forefront here. Now, it's not to say that they're the only group. Uh, and it's also not to say that being a member of the World Economic Forum means that you're only in that group. If you think of it like a Venn diagram, you could be a member of the Trilateral Commission, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, and World Economic Forum, that where they, they all kind of intersect in the middle. You're going to find a, a group of people that sort of show up in all of these places. But the World Economic Forum is driving this. They are the ones that have um, – role-played this. They role-played the, the COVID scenario back in late October of 2019 through a simulation called Event 201 that was a uh, group uh, led by the World Economic Forum 
the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Johns Hopkins Medical Center uh, in, in, in conjunction with others, too. The CIA was involved, uh, uh, World Health Organization, uh, CDC, you know, a bunch of those groups were involved there. And what they did was they simulated the outbreak of a coronavirus that started from bats and wound up uh, spreading all around the world and, and in their scenario killed 65 million people and was only stopped through the uh, introduction of a vaccine. So they role-played these scenarios in advance of, of, what, of, of, our, of what we experienced in uh, early 2020. And it was uh, eerily similar. Uh, their, their scenarios and, and their, their uh, simulation looked almost identical to what wound up happening. And then you start to hear about them. You start to hear their phrase. Their ter- they have a, a little tagline called "Build Back Better," and you start to hear that, that sounds familiar. incorporated. Yeah, it started to get incorporated into the Biden campaign, where they were talking about "Build Back Better." You started to hear uh, Justin Trudeau talk about that in Canada. You started to hear. Uh, Yusinda Ardan in, in New Zealand, a lot of people, a lot of the, the you know, the Five Eyes countries, were, were, they were all starting to talk about build back better. And when you hear something like that and everybody's saying it, it's, it's part of an agenda. And when you look at the World Economic Forum, they're talking about this concept of building back better. Now, that, if you just take that, that term apart a little bit, the key word is back, actually because it implies that you are going to build it back better, that means that it was destroyed. You have to build it back. You know, it's not build it yeah, better. So, some kind of downturn economy yeah. or something. Yeah, so, so something happened. you to build it back. Yes, something happened in, in which you have to build this whole society back better than before. And, and, and like most of their little taglines, they sound good. You know, build back better. Okay, who doesn't? If, you have, if you've lost your home in a hurricane, you're going to build it back better, right? So the idea behind mm-hmm. it is not nefarious. It just depends on who's saying it. So if your contractor is, is telling you that you're, he's going to build your house back, build back better, you're all in favor of that. When Klaus Schwab mm-hmm. is telling you he's going to build back better, I get suspicious because it makes me think, well, well what was wrong with what we had? You know, yeah, we had problems, and yeah, every, not, not everything was working very well. We, we had a, a whole list of problems, but we were we were fine, you know. So, the sales pitch started for that about uh, about three quarters of the way through 2020, or halfway through maybe. You started to hear that term used more and more and more. And when you dig into who the World Economic Forum is and what they have planned or what they want to build back better and what that looks like, it's a form of global communism. It's 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 you'll own nothing, and be happy about it, and you go. Uh, I don't like that idea. <laughs> that doesn't sound like something I would be interested in. So you've got, you've got, uh, you've got them, this, you know, running the sales pitch. Now, interesting that they ran the sales pitch. You know, you can't have the World Economic Forum can't have that sales pitch in 2019. Build back better. Everyone goes, nah, eh, not not really, not interested. That doesn't really make any sense. I don't. Uh, I'm fine the way it is. But if you wait till, you know, a year later, the end of 2020, after everything has been shut down and people are out of jobs and they're scared of viruses and all these things, then you say, hey, listen, we're, we're, we've got this new idea. We're going to build back better. You want to see what we have? And now people are like, well, all right, show me what you've got. You know, what, what are you talking about? And they're right. saying, well, here's our plan. Here's the things that we, we can offer you. It's going to be, you know, you'll own nothing and be happy. Mm, okay, that's not good. Uh, smart cities, micro apartments, um, w- uh, universal basic income, uh, all of these things. We're going to have uh, AI is going to be heavily involved. Of course, we're going to have pre-crime involved in that. Social credit systems are part of that. Now, this is not me like speculating or, or putting on my tinfoil hat to, to, to think about these things. It's all on their website. I mean, they're, they're saying it. They're the ones talking about this. So, so – you listen to their sales pitch. You look at who is involved with them, and it is the worst people in the world, uh, the, 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 the people you would not want to be in charge of building back society, I assure you. And you go, 
what do you guys have planned for us? And what they have planned is the fourth industrial revolution. That's what they're calling it. Now, th once again, sounds interesting. You know, nothing nefarious about that. Well, you could, well, well, who's going to be in charge of this fourth industrial revolution? Well, I'll tell you one person who is going to be involved on the technical side of it is Isabel Maxwell. Last name ring a bell? It's Ghislaine Maxwell's sister. So oh, she's involved. Okay. Yeah, that's not good. Um, and, and so you start to look at all these people and you go, wait a second. This is the same globalist crew. This is Bill Gates. This is the Bezos crew. This is all of these. This is not who I want to be in charge of this. Yes, they're wealthy and powerful and all of that, but but they've got that they've got that Rockefeller mentality, which is when you've got all the money in the world and you've bought everything that has a price tag, you start eventually looking for things that don't have a price tag on it, like the school system, like the idea of, of controlling the schools, where the Rockefellers created that mm -hmm. with Carnegie's, this compulsory schooling system, and, and to, in order to sh and you go, oh, well, that's great, they wanted to educate people. No, 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 no. They wanted to get people trained for a life of moving from the school into their factories, which is the reason why they had the bells set up, you know, like the bell rings after the class is done, and, and the, the the desks are arranged in single file lines and you have to ask for permission to go to the bathroom and you have to you have to get in the line you have to go to you know all those things mimic the factories that's why the rockefellers and carnegies built that and and so you know those those guys were up to no good i mean you 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 eventually figure that out and so now you go well who's in the new generation what's well, bill gates and what is he doing well he's involved in common core the school district, school thing, like here we go again. Another one of these wealthy industrialists that wants to remake society and change the school system in order to create uh, a new generation of people that will be better suited for the things that he has in store for them, like the Fourth Industrial Revolution, like the World Economic Forum's Build Back Green New Deal and all of these things. So it's, what we're seeing is a, is a repeat. It's a, it's a replay of, of what the, the Rockefellers and Carnegies did 100-plus years ago, and it's being sold to us as this utopian idea, this paradise where, you know, you don't have to worry about owning a car. You can just, you know, rent a car. You can just have, like, Uber or, or whatever, and, and you'll live in a, a – you won't have to worry about a yard because you'll be in a micro-apartment, but isn't that going to be great? You'll have less to worry about, and all these things, and you go – you go, God, you know, I feel like that's probably the sales pitch that, that, that Stalin had, you know, for communism back in the days. I feel mm -hmm. like that, that, you know, that, that you go, oh, it's going to be great. Listen, all this food, you know, we're going to have so much food, we're not going to know what to do with it. You're not going to even have to work all that hard. And then meanwhile, the reality was starvation, bread lines, babushkas, uh, you know, uh, dull, gray, Soviet-era buildings that had no personality and no life, and and you just go, I, I, I'm looking at the World Economic Forum, and I'm listening to what they're talking about, and in my head, I'm just going, I bet you it's not going to look anything like their sales pitch, you know? <laughs> so it, it, that, that's who is in charge of this. That's who is, that's who is running this. Not, they're not the only people involved, but they're, they're driving this, and they have... Um, they have put things into full high gear, and, and I would say that their co-conspirators in this would be the United Nations as well, which is, if you want to talk about like a Venn diagram, I mean, the United Nations and the World Economic Forum has a, a, a tremendous amount of overlap. They have a, a similar philosophy and mentality. They have very powerful people working with them, and so they're, a, they're an organization to keep your eyes on as well. So there is a plan. COVID is part of it. The vaccines are part of it, but they're not the only part of it. And that they have, um, you know, this is something that we're going to have to look at in terms of like a decade long idea and not something that is going to be rushed in overnight. So, so you do mention in your book that this, like new world order concept has been around for 
a couple hundred years. Yeah. Um, the changes that cultural changes that have suddenly been thrust on us since um, what, uh, January of 2020. Um, it really seems like the, the uh, these uh, few it's really just a small group of people, and you make it very clear in your book, it's really just a small group of people thing, basically everyone around the globe. Um, America is what the uh, final conquest. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I, I, how how much is idea like the Constitution a major obstacle that they must dismantle? Yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm sure a lot of people after the 2020 election. Um, yeah, you hear reports about some of the um, ballot counting is being uh, redone, but you, you don't get the full story on that. Um, but yeah, it, 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 I'm sure a lot of people think, you know, uh, does voting matter anymore? Well, yeah, that's probably what they don't. Or they they want you to do is you know to start questioning um, you know uh, what was just uh, you know you have a constitutional right to uh, vote yeah um they, uh, yeah, is, they hate that they or, hate the constitution <laughs> yeah yeah is, is this is what we're going through. It now becoming ob- obvious that this is part of the plan, or the, yeah, their plan. That this you know global reset. You hear that term used a lot too. Mm-hmm. I wish it were more obvious to people. Um, you know, we Jeff and I wrote when we wrote the book. We were talking about um, similarities between the fall of the Soviet Union and the soon-to-be fall of the American Empire. And to be clear, the American, we wrote the book's called The Controlled Demolition of the American Empire. We're talking about the, the destruction of the American Empire. It's not necessarily that America itself goes away. It's the, it's the empire of America goes away. And, and the parallels between what happened with the, with the intentional destruction of the Soviet Union are pretty staggering. I mean, there, there's there's obviously the the unwinnable war that they were dragged into in Afghanistan for Afghan, ten years. Yeah, we've, yeah, we've doubled that. It's there's the the it, currency manipulation from exterior forces. We have our currency manipulated by by exterior forces, being the central banks, the privately controlled central banks that are manipulating the money supply. We have the um, the the media. You know, in the Soviet Union, they have Pravda, and everyone's you know the, that was just a propaganda propaganda operation well we have the same thing happening in the united states with the mainstream media you've got you know in 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 the soviet union towards the final days they they brought in their oligarch buddies and and privatized everything that they could we're seeing that happen in america and the politicians just flat out started stealing everything that wasn't nailed down and and we're seeing that here in the united states as well we have you know, we have politicians that are worth hundred, you know, over a hundred million dollars. That should just should just never happen. And and I mean, Congress has legalized uh, insider trading. They made it le- literally made it legal in 2013 that um, people in Congress could 
could trade stocks, you know, could could trade on insider information. So it's we've become a, a bit of a joke here, and 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 our premise uh, in the book is that in order for this new world order concept to take hold, for them to have a one world government, and that is not our term for these maniacs, that's their term that they give themselves. George H. W. Bush is on the record over 200 times during his four years in office of of talking about the new world order. So it's not conspiracy theory. It's not us imagining or giving them names. This is what they call themselves. So, there, But you can't have a global one world government when you still have superpowers existing. So the Soviet Union was slated for destruction in the late 80s, early 90s, and that happened. Mm -hmm. And now the American empire is next. And they need to take the American empire down so that nobody stands in the way of this one world government. And it sounds crazy and it sounds insane when you say it or like, you know, when the first, first time you hear that, you know, it's easy to be dismissive of it and say, oh, get out of here with your one world government stuff. And it's like, no, 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 no. They're talking about this openly. They're writing books about it. They're giving speeches about it. This is what they're trying to do. And um, it doesn't make you a conspiracy theorist for talking about it. It makes you somebody that's, you know, ob ob like observant, you know, looking at, at these things. So, so you've got to, you've got to take down this society. Now, one of the ways you do that is you, you've got, you've got the constitution. You start to talk about, you know, you start to, to make those things seem uh, less important. Well, you know, free speech is kind of an outdated concept or uh, the right to bear arms. We don't really need, let's whittle away at that. Let's, we know that Americans love guns, and they're not going to give up their guns. So let's do the let's do the uh, as David Icke calls it, the totalitarian tiptoe, right? We'll just go just a little bit here, A to B, B to C, C to D, you know, all that. And we'll take away the you know uh, bump stocks. Then we'll take away extended magazines. Then we'll take away you know these types of bullets. Then we'll take away these types of guns. Then we'll take away shotguns. Then we'll take away pistols. And it's just. It's just a slow whittling away of of your rights to the in in, in a way that doesn't you know it, it we're not take they're not taking guns away all at once tomorrow they're just getting you prepped for that by 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 demonizing certain things and and making you feel like parts of this constitution are sort of outdated and we don't really need them oh well what did the founding fathers want you to have an AK forty seven it's like that's a stupid argument but. They, they say this all the time because they want you to question that. And if they can get you thinking that um, statues are racist and that guns are unnecessary and, and, that, and that free speech is uh, subjective and, and all these things, then they can, they can start the process of getting you to think that the Constitution is no longer relevant and necessary, and if they can get you to do that, it's over. Because the, the things that ha have been set up for our protection will no longer be there anymore, and then we are at the mercy of, I mean, look, it, I'm, not a, I'm not a gun nut. I don't like guns. I've had bad experiences. I've had a, you know, I've been, car, I've had someone try to carjack me and my mom. It's horrible or extremely scary. But being disarmed is scarier because I put a quote in my first book from Mao who said, you disarm the population before the slaughter. And that's a guy that would know something about slaughtering the population. So, so these mm -hmm. authoritarian uh, maniacs that come to power, they know this. They know that you've got to disarm the population. Stalin did it. Uh, Hitler did it. Pol Pot did it. Mao did it. That's the rules. You got to you got to disarm the population first. So so they're 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 working on that, on us. They're they're working to get us to give up our guns and things like that. Not you know they'll, they'll try a bunch of different ways. They'll frame it differently. Uh, they'll say well you know look at all this gun violence or school shootings or. Or oh oh that guy had a, a an AR-15 and and that and if if he hadn't had an AR-15 that this whole shooting wouldn't have happened or whatever. Right. It's an agenda, and so you you can see them working on it. If you if you know what to look for, you can see it crystal clear that they're trying to get rid of that. So so we're in a real 
we're we're really at a at a at a pivotal time here in in in, in for America, and that is that this can go one of two ways. You know, if we if we don't stand up to these authoritarians that are in positions of power currently, they will keep taking from us until we stand up to them. That's what the bully does. The bully will bully you until you stand up to, for yourself, you know. So we just – but while they're doing that, they're propagandizing us and telling us that standing up for ourselves is somehow racist, <laughs> you know, which is, doesn't uh-huh. make any sense. Or, or it's, it's – it's uh you know you're a you're a uh, you're a militia member or you're a conspiracy theory whatever title they can get put on you to make you feel a little bit less than they will do that in, in order to get you to get move away from the things that you are clinging to so that they can take them from you so it's a real devious uh, method that they're using but but if we don't stand up for ourselves if we don't recognize this. Uh, and, and call it out for what it is. We may, may be at a point where, where we have no ability to fight back, where we are all stuffed in these smart cities, and we have um, we can't, you know, we own nothing, and, and we're, we've never been happier, right? As they say. So we're, we've got to, um, you know, there's there's no. You're not allowed to be ignorant on this one. You know, everybody needs to wake up to this. Everybody needs to get involved. I know a lot of people don't want to, or they want to think, well, I'll just let someone else deal with this or worry about it. Can't do that anymore. The time has come for us to all be aware of this, and and that's the the first step towards stopping it. Yeah, and you know, when I was in, I went to a private high school. And we we read uh, 1984. I'm sure that's uh, not being read too frequently now. Uh, also read uh, Solzhenitsyn's One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, and you know, I've been reading uh, Gulag Archipelago as well. You, know, you can see you know, what you talk about in your book, how you know, the people influencing schools you, know, you take away some of those books and then all the banned books like you know, Huckleberry Finn, um, where people are going to see the hopelessness of these – well, it's really a dystopia of 1984 or um, – being sent to, you know, uh, Gulag Archipelago is a autobiography of Solzhenitsyn's, you know, just being sent to a prison camp, you know, being moved around Russia. I don't think he was, ever knew what he was charged with. Didn't make any difference. Yeah, but you know uh, we aren't going to talk about that that in schools today. You know, uh, it was big news when he emigrated to, but uh, is you know work in some some more literature to go with you know your historical and political theorist uh, writings, you know, there might be, it's time for a change in schools as well if they even go back in, in the session. It, you know, it, yeah. If the public would be aware of uh, Orwell and Solzhenitsyn uh, wrote about, or even talked to some of the Cuban immigrants who, not many live in Florida. Why did you leave there? Yeah. Do you really want that? Do you really or are you going to allow that ideology to come to America? It seems. 
we've we you mentioned something interesting about you know the idea of we have to you know, changing the, the the schools the way the schools are when they come back yeah they're being changed for sure uh, by the the, the the Marxists, you know, I never thought that that was going to be the problem with schools. I always thought the lack of funding or the, the just the poor curriculum was going to be the thing. But that's that does in the, the, the kids. But it, really what we're seeing is this the, the woke culture coming in and the um, – sexualization of kids being you know taught being taught younger and like uh, abnormally young ages and things like that and and it just it's a, it's a strange un, very unusual and very fast uh, switch that happens in in the schools and and you're starting to see parents push back we've seen in New York City mm-hmm. a lot of the private school kids are pushing back against the uh, the, the families are pushing back against the critical race theory being taught and things like that, and and I say good, good. They need to stand up for this because if well, they don't, it will just steamroll them. Yeah, and you also had what that school district, New Jersey, where all the holidays were now just called days off, and yeah, <laughs> and, and it's like you know Christmas, it, yeah, you know, like he, he, you know the Christmas holidays. Uh, you know, we don't have school this uh, this week. Uh, it, it's it, it's just called a day off. You know, it's just just like uh, you know when Fauci you know was saying last you know the end of uh, you know the summer. Oh, boy, I, I I tell you, you know, we we better watch these at Thanksgiving. Paul, you know, getting getting together, uh, and you know, the, the, you know, there's that you know, kind of giving thanks to that uh, God guy, and but especially do not gather for Christmas. You know, uh, for you know, you know, we've heard you know Jesus might be a pretty nice guy, but it, you know. We we really don't want yeah, that's going to be the worst time. Uh, all the pandemic is going to you know, really kick in there around mm-hmm. Christmas time. So uh, you know you have to get get rid of all this uh, God stuff and you know don't don't go to church and sing. But the, the strip club can remain open, right? And, and, and as well as the uh, a liquor store, you can get purple Jesuses there. Yeah, <laughs> but but yeah. but yeah, there's this uh, interesting philosophy in that you, you do mention that you know takes us back to that pre-Nazi uh, philosophy that you know, help to fuel uh, what was going on in the 1930s. You know, you're calling that the uh, Hegelian... Um, dialectic, yeah. It, yeah, the dialectic, where, it, it, you know, there's a lot of that, uh, you know, if, if we have to kind of get rid of the, you know, the Bible, you know, the, you know, you know there's a lot of good, you know, good stuff in there, how, how to li- live a decent life. So, you know, if you get rid of that, and you can see where it steps into, or crosses over into, uh, you have to get rid of, like, the Jewish people, and it just kind of snowballs into just eliminating all these ideas or people who get in the way and supplant them with something else. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah, they made it so that you couldn't congregate in places where you would, where you would find community, churches and places like that. Um, I mean, we saw we saw what they're doing in Canada. The insanity there is off the charts. And um, they did, you know, you can't, you can't hang out, you can't open your bars. 
you know you can ha have a restaurant but you got to you have to close by a certain amount of t you know a certain hour and things like that and it occurred to me they just don't want people talking they don't want people getting together saying hey i don't think this is right i think that what we're experiencing mm -hmm. might not be as authentic as they're leading us to believe yeah you know so if you can keep everyone away from each other and going back to what you where we started this conversation when you were reading those quotes you were, there there was part of it where they were talking about the isolation, about keeping people away, and yeah. and I think they know that. I think they know that you, you the if you're going to, you know, unfurl this this massive uh, scam on everyone, you have to keep them from having the conversations to figure out that it's the, that it actually is a scam. So you keep them cooped up in their home. That does a, a variety of things, like we talked about. Keeps them out of the sunlight, right? <laughs> keeps them out of mm -hmm. out of their off, you know, from working and going places and interacting. Makes them a little bit crazy and depressed. And, and but it, but more importantly, it keeps them from 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 having a sense of community and from talking to one another. Because what they don't want is people talking. Because if people are talking to each other, it's the next step is fairly easy for them to start figuring this whole thing out. So it's been a it's interesting the way they have they have this um, whole thing set up. It's it's uh, it's got to be frustrating to people that are, you know, that have a, a have their religious institutions as a focal point of their of their world to have that go away from them for you know a year uh, or so um, has to be completely destabilizing to a lot of people. And I think that that is not accidental. I think they wanted that to happen. So uh, that and, and you do that if you are really, really a diabolical person, you know, to, to do yep. that, to keep people away from the things that make them feel whole in life. Boy, you are really in, a, in, a, in an awful uh, – uh, you're, you're in a real bad place when you're, when you're convincing people to do that. So it's been a, a wild ride. I hope this thing is almost over, but the best thing we can do is have the conversations now and get people thinking about these things so that it never happens again. Yeah, and yeah, it just seems like it's been in the works for a while. And you even get that uh, one YouTube clip where Fauci's talking about in the, in, in the waning days of the Obama administration, he says you know, the next administration is going to have to deal with the surprise pandemic. Uh, you know, yep. they, uh, this sounds like it's been in the works for a long time. Yeah. Well, maybe since as far back as uh, the Spars pandemic document of 2017, you know, <laughs> when you're talking mm -hmm. about that, that simulation as well. So uh, I think that this is uh, has been planned. I think that the people that are behind it are some of the most dangerous people in the world and um, – and I think it's everybody. It's in everybody's best interest to educate themselves on this, so that uh, so that they know who who they're up against and what these people are trying to accomplish. Okay, uh, uh, Charlie. Yeah, you know, it sounds like some great advice. We're down to uh, like 45 seconds or so. Uh, can you, Can you give everyone a quick plug how to, how to get the, uh, your book? Uh, it, uh, this book is w worth reading to lower your social score, but raise your IQ. <laughs> okay, and yeah, th th then we'll have to uh, wrap for the night. Sure. You can go to my website, theoctopusofglobalcontrol.com. You can find information on the books, my podcast, Macroaggressions, my group podcast, The Union of the Unwanted. Everything is there. Um, that's the best place to get a hold of me and find me. And, and uh, if you want to communicate with me, I have uh, contact information there. People can reach me. I'm always available. And thank you guys so much for having me on. I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Thanks, uh, Charlie. It, it was uh, great fun. Uh, sure, we'll be in trouble uh, very shortly. And uh, just want to say good night. Uh, keep uh, tune in to Nightlight. We have uh, more great shows lined up for the rest of the week. Take care.